mentioned the male-dominated uh, patriarchal world, um, and I, I do want to talk about gender. I don't want to ignore uh, the gender thing. Um, being the first woman ever to translate Homer's Odyssey into English, first of all, I, I do want to ask why it's taken so long. I mean, aside from the, the male-dominated academia since the very beginning of academia, you know, they, I, I was actually surprised that no women had yeah. attempted. Yes. Uh, you know, there are, there are 60 tr translations of the Odyssey. I was really surprised that no women had attempted to translate this poem. In fact, I was speaking with a couple of, of, of friends about you, and, and they said, really? No way. Not in the 70s, not in the 80s, the 90s. No, no one has, no women have taken up the Odyssey. And so that's, that's one side of things that I want to ask you. And then there's another um, less politically correct question that I, I genuinely feel like I need to ask you. Um, I'm, I'm very curious about, I mean, I thought your translation was brilliant and edgy and very logical. And is there such a thing as a female translation of a work of literature like Homer's Odyssey? So mm -hmm. will readers read your translation of the Odyssey in a different way because they know that it was translated by a woman? Are they right to? Uh, mm -hmm. Or is this sort of the problem? Is this, is this actually problematic? Could this be used against women in an unfair no. way? So the first question is, why has it taken so long? And the second question is, is your translation affected by by your gender? Mm -hmm. Right. So I think the... I was shocked when I realized... I mean, I, so it was only after Norton if, if asked me to do the translation that I that I found out that I was going to be the first woman to translate it. I was shocked to realize wow. that, that was true. I mean, 2017 or, you know, five years ago, 2012, still didn't happen. And, you know, 300 years ago, there was a French prose um, translation by a woman. There have been plenty of translations by women into other languages. So English is the problem. Um, there's also, it's also the case that, I mean, of course, there are many, many, many female classicists. So there, are, there are many women who've read, studied, written about, um, written about Homer. It's not like I'm the only, you know, female Homerist. But that, I think that thing, maybe to get to the question of why has a woman not done a translation before, we have to get both to, um, obviously it couldn't have happened or it was very unlikely to happen before about the 20th century, even though there were it was a tiny handful of elite learned women classicists. Before that, it, the numbers were very, very small. But so even in the 20th century, when there have been tons and tons of of women who had very, very deep knowledge of Greek, knowledge of the Homeric poems, why didn't they do a translation? I think there's like a couple of reasons. One is that um, women do get tenure at lower rates than women. So if you're going to invest the time in doing a project, you need to make sure that it's something which isn't going to damage your career. But, but translation isn't something which will get you tenure. It, it will, it's something that will take enormous amounts of time and will, in a way, potentially be a black mark rather than a really mark. really can i pause you for a second there so you do <laughs> yes. a translation of a of a classic work of literature which is an in, which is this long arduous just unbelievably intellectually rigorous project and that doesn't help you work towards tenure but i imagine what are you supposed to publish a bunch of articles in journals that no one ever reads and that gets you tenure it's supposed to do the, do the right kind of scholarly monographs, yes. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's not like, yeah, I, I, the, the, it's not, a, I don't want to be sort of saying that all of my colleagues don't get it, because I think many of my colleagues very much do get it and embrace the whole process of, of translation and recognize the value of it. But I think the whole structure of how, um, of how tenure assessment happens is, is very much skewed towards the scholarly monograph, the peer-reviewed scholarly monograph. And it's not at all skewed towards other kinds of writing. Other kinds of writing, you can do them on the side, but they're not actually going to get you up the career ladder. Um, so, I mean, I think given all that, and also then I guess the, the third thing to mention is that, of course, women usually have, I mean, on average, more they have to spend more time in their week doing childcare, elder care, domestic labor. Mm -hmm. That's still true in 2017. So I think given all, all like that cluster of things, both that translation is sometimes valued but not exactly in the career ladder way and then women are also going to struggle in different ways within academia i think it gets you to some other reason I and mean, i think it's also just relevant to notice that um if you think about it, a wonderful woman translator like sarah rudin she doesn't um she doesn't have like a tenured professorship you know she does it she just does translation 
so the the whole thing of just being a woman who both has the um the scholarly skills to do it but then also whatever support to be able to do it financially and then I think I guess maybe a, like a third, I can't remember how many points I've made right now, but the, um, I think a, another layer of this is just about um, it's a small set of people who are interested in doing translation anyway. I mean, there are plenty of sc classical scholars who aren't as interested in it because it's, I mean, in a way it's a creative writing project as much as it's I was going to say that. So I think like, that already cuts the possible pool of people down. And then, if you've already if you've cut cut the pool way down, and then there are already extra ways to cut down the pool of the female possible translators of the Odyssey, then I think you can sort of see why the dice are more against it than you might initially think. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, I still find it shocking and, and astonishing. And you know, I hope that you know, in fifty years' time, we won't be still sort of saying, "But has no woman done this, that, or the other translation?" But maybe we will. I don't know. I agree. And, and I heard a statistic recently, and I, I don't know if it's true, um, but I heard that 80% um, of humanity's papers are never cited once. And yet, if you, mm -hmm. no matter who you are, if you produce a translation, a quality translation of the, of the Odyssey, it's going to be read hundreds of thousands of times yes. at least. I mean, you're you're yes. not you're in the history books. You're on the list, you know. So, so. <laughs> list. But I think the thing is also, I, I, then also, it doesn't just affect how students, general readers approach the Odyssey. It also, in fact, affects how people who've read the poem in Greek read it. I mean, translations actually have an impact on the history of interpretation afterwards. I mean, maybe this can get us to the gender question, which was the second part of your question mm -hmm. before. Um, I mean, I guess part of my answer is, I think we should talk about Robert Fagel's and Richmond Lattimore and Stanley Lombardo's gender too. I mean, we should talk about those translations right. as white male American translations. And I think that if we can admit that gender should gender is not a not a sort of neutral thing, the whole person, which might include gender, um, it affects your work. However, I mean, so I think there's a sort of there's a danger of people making the assumption that. If your gender or your personal history or your particular interests affect your work, that means you're somehow biased or not affected or not uh, not objective. And I think that's the whole mistake. I mean, I think you can be very, very scholarly, very, very responsible, trying to be as truthful as you possibly can be to every element that you can that you can see and pick out and hear and read in the original. And then, even given all that, two people from two different demographic backgrounds and with two different personalities and two different sets of literary ears, poetic senses, all that, are going to produce something very, very different. So I, I think given that that's the case, then of course gender is one of the things that's going to impact it. I mean, I think it's it's notable to me that, you know, there are these, there are obvious scenes that, that one can pick out um, about the way that there has been some, some real gender blindness in the way people have translated the Odyssey. And... You know, because, of course, being male is the unmarked gender category. Like Men very often think, I don't need to think about gender because I have the right gender. Right, but right. Women have to think, I actually do need to think about gender because it's a problem for me. It's not a problem for men. Right. So I think it's the strength of, of my capacity to, to read, interpret, and translate Homer that I'm, I'm aware of gender. I'm thinking about it. And it, obviously it's a poem which is very much interested in gender roles and in gender inequality, gender hierarchies, um, gender relationships. So I think it's it's an advantage that I'm I'm not switched off on that part of um, the reading experience. I'm thinking about it critically. Right. So nobody, I mean, I'm sure nobody has asked Robert Fagels ever if his male bias in, influences no. his no. interpretation <laughs> of, of, then, uh, of the Odyssey. Not, the late lamented Fagels, he's, he's, yes, it's too late to ask him now, but yeah. <laughs> It's, it's, in a way, it's it's sad, but it's it's revealing that it's just sort of assumed that of course, of course he's a man because that's the that's the normal way to be, you know. R right. They so have not humans are the women. So I mean, I, I just uh, so one of the, one of the classic cases that that I've talked about before is the case where um, my Telemachus insists on hanging the slave women, who in most other translations are not called slave women; they're called the disobedient serving maids. Which right. Again. Is, it's a whole other set of, not necessarily gendered, but it's a whole other set of social biases. Um, because, of course, in the Greek, it's clear that they're slaves. And then in, for instance, the Robert Fagel's version, he makes Telemachus say, you sluts, the suitors whores. And the Greek doesn't have any abuse in the language. It, has, it says, I need to hang those who were sleeping with the suitors. 
So that was his, that was, he injected that into the text. That's his gender. I mean, that, that's his particular um, gender. You know, he, he's not thinking about it. I don't think he deliberately decided, I'm going to do a misogynistic translation of the Odyssey, you know. But of course, there is an element of that. Um, I mean, I think it plays out even in less shocking scenes. You know, I, I was just was looking at, um, at the way that different translators translate the, the scene that we were just talking about, where Odysseus is with Calypso and he wants to leave. Um, and in other translations that I've looked at, it's very much skewed, much more than the original is, towards the perspective of Odysseus. Mm -hmm. And Calypso is described as... I name. noticed that about your translation. Yeah. And I, I don't think that the connotations of nymph, for instance, in English, are very sort of othering and distancing. And you can't actually have respect for somebody who's a nymph, right? <laughs> you, it, that's going to be somebody who's floating around in a see-through dress and not actually you know, a real person. And the, the whole depiction of female sexual desire in that scene, um, I don't think the Greek is mocking her, but I think most of the translations of that scene are mocking her. They're presenting her as this absurd figure who's about to be dumped. And I actually don't think that the original is doing that. I think it's showing us the pain on both sides. So, so I, I think just being willing to, to, to suspend some kind of judgment and figure out whether whether each of the characters in this text are more more fully alive. I think that's actually a good thing. It's not, not it, it sort of can be presented as she's biased. She's interpreting something. But I think I'm in a way trying to get deeper under the the skin of the original. So, given that Homer was obviously Homer existed in a patriarchal world, whether Homer is a tradition or whether Homer is a person, Homer existed in a patriarchal world. So I wonder if you have felt that as a translator, it is your responsibility to sort of recreate a patriarchal world. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, in some senses, you have to. Right. I mean, I'm not going to change the story, right? And I'm not going to change any any element of what the what the text is saying. I mean, not, at least I'm not going to sort of try and... I, I see that it says that, um, that Odysseus left Calypso, but in fact, I, I think it would be better if he stayed there. I'm going to change that. I don't do that. I mean, I, I try and bring out every element that I see in each line and each word. Um, but I, it, it depends how you shape the story, right? I mean, if, if you can translate the exact same sentence in a totally accurate way, but with a different tone. So what, what I want to do is just make sure that everything is that I see there, or as much as I can bring out, that I think is visible, should be visible. And that might include inviting people to, to see this is about inequality, rather than just sort of in, using a, a narrative or poetic mode which suggests, please don't think about this, it's back in the day, it's historical, you know? So I think there are ways that, that if you write more clearly and you're more clear about what's actually happening in the text, you can invite more a, a more critical discourse in response. Do you think, though, that Homer intentionally, like, don't, don't you think that it was Homer's intention to portray Calypso as an over-sexualized, uh, lascivious, greedy, desiring uh, nymph? I don't, I don't see that. I mean, I, I, I don't I think... Homer's intention, it doesn't really make sense because, you know, this poem is based on a centuries old tradition. It's a it's folk art. It's it's the product of many different people. Um, if there even if, if we imagine that there was a single person who wrote it down in the late eighth or early seventh century, can we ever reconstruct the mind of that person? All we have is, is the text. I don't see in that scene is the text showing us or hinting that there's something wrong with Calypso. I just don't see that. I, I see that it's presenting, it's showing us in a um, in a really, really acute way um, what she's like, how she feels. Um, and it's also constantly using the dignified epithets like Potni Athea. She's a revered goddess. You don't describe a character in Homer like right, that unless right. you want to give dignity to the character. I, mm. I just don't think it makes sense to say that, of course, because we imagine that the archaic Greeks must have been far more sexist than we are, then we're going to project all the modern sexism back onto the portrayal of Calypso, even if we don't have textual evidence. I think we actually would need a lot more textual evidence than we have to say that. Gotcha. I mean, it's not that, gotcha. I, it's not that I think there's gotcha. no inequality in the Odyssey. Of course there is. But I just think it's handled much more subtly than some of the translations would lead you to believe. So 
I want to talk a little bit about uh, Penelope. I want to ask you if Penelope, if we can consider her as some kind of early feminist. I mean, for me, the predicament that she's in in this book, where she's asking herself, am I a wife or am I a widow? Um, should I stay loyal to my husband who's been gone a really, really, really unreasonably long time? Um, or is my husband dead? In which case I have to figure out what I'm going to do. I have to, I have to marry one of these gross suitors. Telemachus is not the man that Odysseus is. And Penelope seems to me to be a woman who's trying to figure out who she is throughout the book and remaining strong. Um, she's doing the trick with the loom. She's, she's not just a, you know, weak, vulnerable, helpless woman, even though she's not, you know, the wife of Bath or Medea, I, she does seem to be kind of an, a, a proto-feminist character, if you ask me. Um, and I, I think I read something in the New York Times where you talked about the debate as to whether she is a second wave feminist or or not. Um, I don't know. I, do, I think I talk about second wave feminist readings of the of the Odyssey, which have so the, there's been a whole debate in classical scholarship about how to read Penelope and to what extent is it a feminist reading if you present her as a totally empowered woman. Okay. So I mean, I think I would talk about a feminist reading as opposed to well, obviously, obviously Penelope hasn't read Germaine Greer. <laughs> I, I'm not. I don't think I would argue that. Um, so I think I mean asking is. Calypso is the one who says it's not fair because the male gods judge themselves by different standards from the female gods. That's true. Penelope never says that. Um, I think we have, you know, we have this trio of elite women in the uh, elite wives in the Odyssey. We have Helen, who's this wonderfully smart, um, in a way, Odyssean weaver of stories, weaver of disguises, um, controller of appearances. Um, we, who, who is also, of course, the adulteress, but. <laughs> Who's judging? And then we also have Calypso. I mean, we also have Clytemnestra always in the background as you don't want the wife like that. The wife is going to kill you when you get back home. Um, and we never actually sort of get to hear Clytemnestra's point of view, but she's always the dark, she and Helen are the dark counterparts of Penelope. And I think the Penelope that we see in this poem is a Penelope who's, who's constantly just defined by the constraints that are put around her. That when we get to get access to her mind is through her dreams, because those are the only places where she can move. Um, and then we have that wonderful sequence in book 19 where she talks about her her dream about the geese when Odysseus is still in disguise and he ha and they, there hasn't been the recognition yet. He's still the homeless old beggar. And she tells the, the story of how she dreamed that there were geese in her yard and then an eagle swooped in and killed all the geese. And then the eagle said, I'm your husband. I'm going to come back and kill all the suitors. And she says, in my dream, I was crying because the eagle killed my geese. And Odysseus responds by saying, there's no possible misinterpretation of this dream. It means I'm going to come back and kill the suitors. Great, yay. But it, I think what it shows is this real complexity in Penelope's psyche that, that who knows what she wants. Maybe she doesn't want the, those suitors to be killed. And that would be a fairly reasonable thing not to want that. But it's also clear, I think, in the portrayal of Penelope that she knows she's not necessarily going to get what she wants. I mean, the way that she's constantly describing her marriage is it's located in the time when he left. And from the time that he left me, I've been marked. My, my, my face has been marked, my bed has been marked. My whole heart, house is stained by the, this abandonment and this loss. Um, and she also knows that you know she can put off the suitors forever, but then her father and her brothers are pressuring her to marry somebody. So it's not, she only, in contrast to Odysseus, who is Polu in all these different ways, he's many, he has many choices, many places, he can travel. He's always always leaving, always turning around. She doesn't have choices. She, there's potentially the choice to choose one man or choose another man. But even that is a constrained kind of choice. Right. In fact, I was just looking at the, like another, another, another passage. Um, at that moment when, um, when Odysseus, still in the skies, describes Odysseus to Penelope, and she starts crying, and it's like her face is melting, like the snow that melts on the mountaintops. And that's how she cried and cried. And I, I, I looked at other translations of that passage I mean, after I, just a couple of days ago, because I was curious about how other people had done it. 
And I realized that it's very often very normalized, such that people say her, her tears were running down her face or her tears were melting. But what the original says is that her face was melting, her cheeks were melting. So I think she has, she's presented as having this experience of disintegration, that, she's, um, that her relationship with her husband, her love for her husband, or her, her difficult feelings about him and about her whole um, constrained situation are experienced as this death of the self. Um, and I don't, I, don't, I don't see it as a non-feminist move to say that. I mean, to say that this is a poem which evokes how horrible it is to be a very competent, very smart person who has such limited choices. How about Circe? So, Circe, the, the, uh, the uh, taking care of the, the male chauvinist pigs. What do you think about Circe? Yeah, yes. <laughs> I think Circe's great. It's, it's, it's a fun episode in the poem. Um, I mean, in a way, I think the, the whole Circe episode also says very interesting things about Odysseus's relationship with his men, right? I mean, the way that he forces them to go, go back to the palace of Circe and says, you know, if you don't go back, I'm going to chop your head off because you know, he's that kind of leader. Um, but I think it's, it's, in, it's interesting how there's both this sort of parallelism with, the, with Calypso, but between Circe and Calypso, they're in some ways very similar, but also very different. I mean, there's this sort of literal, literalization of what happens on Calypso's island in the island of Circe, that instead of just keeping the man in hiding where his human or masculine identity is under the shadow of the intertwining cave on Circe's Island, it's sort of, it's, it's a literal hiding of, of the masculine or in, into the brutish.